Okay, thank you so much, Ravi. So just for uh, people who are just tuning in right now, so we have a 35-year-old um, with a recent uh, history of MBA who's coming in after two days um, with difficulty urinating, uh, lower extremity weakness, and uh, pins and needle sensations in the hand. And over the last two days, she had multiple falls with some um, injuries to her upper extremities as well. So uh, it's hard to ignore um, the MBA, right? So she was in a motor vehicle accident and, you know, otherwise healthy 35 year old. So the question that becomes uh, uh, gaining a better understanding of what actually happened. So um, uh, like direction of the force, the speed that she was going in. And it kind of sounds like um, she didn't receive any care for it, but she evaluated after by EMS or in the ED or not. Um, and the things too, like you want to also, if she was like wearing a seatbelt or not, the good question to ask, you know, if she was going high speed and she was wearing a seatbelt that can predispose her to some more intra-abdominal injuries. Um, and in her case, you know, she is now complaining about a difficulty walking. So did she have a spinal cord injury, especially with the urinating uh, difficulty with that? The other one to ask about is um, bowel incontinence um, and uh, kind of thinking about, you know, your neuroaxis and spinal cord, you know, is your no misdiagnosis here. Um, the other things that can happen is that whether it's like, you know, a vertebral fractures are we talking about that causing a cord compression? Is there a hematoma of some sort? Um, uh, putting some um, pressure in it, uh, anything that with force can cause transient bacteremia and abscess formation, which is like a, the timing is a little off for that. But again, like, you know, bony damage, hematoma, muscle injuries are all kind of the things to think about in someone who has an MVA. Kind of want to do a trauma survey. Um, can I do a trauma survey? It's been a while. So I usually uh, rely on my general surgery colleagues to help us with that. Uh, so then I'll pass the mic to Jack to see if he has any additional thoughts. Oh, that was such, such a brilliant response. I am, um, uh, I have nothing to add to that. I think that is phenomenal. And I agree with, with everything that you said. Robbie, we'll kick it back to you to take us, take us, uh, take us forward here. Sure. Um, so past medical history is just the, the substance abuse, no, no medical history at all. I'll jump to the physical exam. So vitals, temperature 36.5, heart rate 90, respiratory 20, blood pressure 107 over 74, pulse ox 99% room air. Neurological exam. The other history is normal. I'm just going to cut to the chase, but the neuro exam, decreased strength in lower extremities, three out of five uh, in the upper, four out of five in the lower. Symmetric bilateral decreased sensation to light touch, pinprick, and proprioception of her hands. Also, lower extremities up to the mid thigh. Upper extremity reflex is normal. Lower extremities diminish patella and Achilles bilaterally with upward Babinski. And again, emphasizing the rest is normal. Do you want me to move on to the labs? Sure, that sounds good. Okay. Uh, so the CBC showed a Y count of 3.6. Hemoglobin 10.9, hematocrit 33.4, MCV 102, platelets 196, and I'll and the chemistry was normal, and I'll stop there. All right. Well, um, you know, I think obviously the, the real meat of what we've just gathered right now is in the exam, which is really helping to clarify many of the many of the addition or many of the original hypotheses that Charmin outlined for us. And I think we're continuing to see 
an illness script building for some sort of neurological problem, right? And now it's it sort of is our job to continue to localize it. Charmin told us about the original localization to the spinal cord, both given the clinical syndrome that the patient's presenting with, the combination of motor and sensory changes plus autonomic changes should, should immediately localize us to the spinal cord because that's oftentimes the combination that, that we're gonna see together. The sort of three features of a myelopathy are going to be bilateral symmetric motor changes, plus or minus sensory changes, oftentimes with some component of autonomic dysfunction, which usually manifests as bowel or bladder incontinence or retention. And so in this case, the exam that we have really just continues to strengthen that hypothesis, but there's some features that we have to contend with that don't that maybe don't perfectly fit with a myelopathy here. For example, when someone has a myelopathy, we usually expect there to be signs of upper motor neuron disease, which includes things like hyperreflexia. In this case, we have diminished patella and, and Achilles reflexes, which begs the question of, is that compatible with a myelopathy or incompatible with a myelopathy? It's important to note that in the early phases of an acute spinal cord injury or an um, uh, excuse me, it's important to note that in the early phases of any acute spinal cord process, whether it's a myelitis, a spinal cord infarct, or spinal cord injury, you can actually see hyporeflexia or areflexia. It oftentimes takes days for things like the hyperreflexia to set in. And so the fact that we had some potential recent trauma within the last couple of days makes the diminished patellar and, and Achilles reflexes compatible with a myelopathy that could be developing. We then have to ask ourselves, well, then how can we potentially localize this, right? We have upper extremity and lower extremity weakness, which puts us a little bit higher up in the spinal cord here. The next question then is going to be, well, how can we sort of think about what types of things could cause a myelopathy? And the way that I usually think about a myelopathy is through the first bucket of, is this a compressive myelopathy or a non-compressive myelopathy? Compressive myelopathies can be due to things like musculoskeletal problems, which we certainly have risk factors for with the motor vehicle accident. And Charmin already outlined those brilliantly, right? Things like bony abnormalities or fractures things like hematomas that could develop after a traumatic event. But then there's also non-musculoskeletal compressive myelopathies, which could include things, for example, like an infectious, my, um, uh, um, like an infectious spondylitis that's impinging on the spinal cord or a spinal epi ep epidural abscess. We know that she has risk factors for um, or we know that she at least has a history of polysubstance use disorder, but we don't quite know necessarily what exactly those substances were, right? We may want to engage in some, in, um, some consideration of whether or not there is injection drug use, but I would actually pause on thinking about that as a risk factor until we have that history from her, because we don't want to anchor on thinking about her substance use as the most likely cause of this, of this myelopathy, or particularly without that type of confirmation. But again, Compressive myelopathy is usually musculoskeletal, an infectious process like an abscess, or rarely we can have tumors that have metastasized to the spinal cord or very rarely started in the spinal cord that could also cause a compressive myelopathy. But then there's also non-compressive myelopathies, which could include things like spinal cord infarcts or things that we commonly see on VMR, um, something like a transverse myelitis but those transverse myelitides are usually gonna be caused by some sort of infectious or autoimmune process. And we don't necessarily have a syndrome of inflammation here. So I think what, what we can use from the exam is say, we're building a case for a myelopathy, even with some of the atypical findings, because again, the time course fits with areflexia early on in, or areflexia or hyporeflexia early on. And then we have to ask ourselves, is this compressive or non-compressive? MRI can help answer that question, but we can also use some of the history as well as some of the labs to get a sense of whether or not we're dealing with more likely a compressive or a non-compressive process. And again, the non-compressives are usually gonna be inflammatory in nature. So Charmaine, I'm curious, do you make, like, or do, do, do the labs help you here at all? Or is there anything else from the exam that's really jumping out to you? That was amazing, Jack. Love listening to you discuss. I think um, the thing that jumps out to me the most, you know, uh, the. Uh, there were blood cell hemoglobin and the platelets are all like lower limits of 
normal and she has a little bit of an anemia and if you look at that mcv she has a little bit of microcytosis so the question becomes like is there any clues in that microcytosis that can help us and when i think about microcytosis i think about like whether it's um a megaloblastic or non-megaloblastic so you know if you have a anemia uh, what does your bone marrow do you have a reticulocytosis right more immature cells that are going to be in your blood her anemia is not that severe um uh, but it, it can happen. And the other thing to note, even with the hematomas that would cause like in a spinal cord, like you're not, don't have to lose that much blood versus like we lose a lot of it in our GI tract, in our thighs, in our bellies. Um, but, you know, if they're in small uh, spaces, doesn't require that much blood loss to cause issues, um, the leg in your spinal cord. The other thing that can cause not um, a megaloblastic, so like your alcohol, thyroid, liver uh, issues. Um, and then in the megaloblastic categories, you know, your bone marrow issues like your amyloidysplasia that she's like too young for, or your nutritional deficiencies, like B12 is a big one to think about, um, um, that can also have a lot of neurological manifestations. And then copper, folate and copper, and copper especially is like the one that I always tend to forget. Um, and then meds that, you know, she is, we know she's not taking like methotrexate, um, type medications um, that can cause uh, macrocytosis. Um, so I think the question <laughs> is whether she has some nutritional deficiency, uh, given you know, her priorities or substance use and if that all contributing, or like, you know, does that a little bit of anemia points to it. A lot of the infections that you were talking about, Jack, like it's I, I almost like it's pyogenic, like more <laughs> indolence causes of cancers, myelitis might not have a leukocytosis. So that doesn't really uh, persuade me one way or the other. I think like um, getting some imaging um, and going from there would be the next step. Okay, so imaging is being requested. So uh, MRI of the spinal cord showed um, no fracture, uh, no lesion causing cord compression, but there was abnormal hyper intensities within the dorsal cervical cord on axial series, V-shaped T2 hyper intensities noted within the dorsal spinal cervical cord, um, which may give the, the answer. Uh, but on questioning the patient in regards to her substance use, uh, the patient is using a lot of inhalants. So she's using various forms of nitrous oxide and then something called whippets from whipped cream canisters about 20 to 50 times daily for the past two and a half months. I'll stop there before disclosing the final diagnosis. Take us home, Jack. No, it's your turn. It's your turn. Uh, all right. Well, we can we can share this. So I think um, if we were to just use to use a methodical approach to what the imaging tells us, the imaging confirms that we have some sort of spinal cord process, but it's not a spinal cord process that we maybe necessarily anticipate, right? We don't see compressive issues and we, we, we don't necessarily see some of the things that we may expect to see with something like an inflammatory myelitis, right? There's no cord compression, there's no hematoma, there's no fracture, there's no abscess, and we don't see signs of tumors. Then the question becomes, well, what are things that can cause a dorsal column process that may also cause a clinical syndrome on the labs that we see here? And Charmin absolutely brilliantly walked us through the fact that we have some signature of disease that may suggest a nutritional deficiency, particularly a B12 deficiency here. The other thing that we got from Ravi is the fact that this is an, is an individual who has been using whippets or nitrous, um, nitrous oxide um, in very, very high amounts. And this is one of those things that's worth sort of, sort of downloading into our brains as, as, an, as a worthwhile disease association, which is that whippets can cause a rapidly progressive acquired B12 deficiency. So I, don't necess I do not know the pathophysiology or the mechanics of this, of this at all. But we have what we we have both a risk factor in terms of the history of whippet use combined with a clinical syndrome 
of what is actually a myeloradiculopathy. So B12 deficiency, we, we can sometimes think about it as causing a neuropathy or a radiculopathy, but then it can also cause a dorsal column myelopathy, which we see on the MRI here. That gives us these sort of competing exam findings that we have here. The radiculo or the radiculopathy slash neuropathy leads to the, the diminished reflexes, whereas the cord lesions themselves also lead to the bilateral upper and lower extremity weakness. And so it seems likely here that what we're dealing with, given the fact that we have a low grade macrocytic anemia and the history of whippet use, as well as the compatible clinical syndrome, is potentially a rapidly progressive acquired B12 deficiency related to underlying nitrous oxide or whippet use. That's about as much as I know about this, about this, about this disease entity, that it is an association between the, um, between the use of nitrous oxide and the clinical presentation of what looks like B12 deficiency. But the difference between classic B12 deficiency is that this can happen over a very, very quick period of time rather than the slow indolent course that we normally see with, with traditional B12 deficiency. Sharmin, sure, mean, do you have, um, I'm curious if, if you know other, other things about this. It's been, it's one of those topics that's like been on my list to learn more about for weeks and I always just push it off and I wish that I had looked up more now. No, that was absolutely brilliant. I couldn't agree more. Um, you're absolutely right about the acute presentation. I think it can also cause like more acute neurologic and acute hematological abnormalities. And I, in terms of the mechanism of action, I thought there was an issue with the clearance of, um, but I'm not 100% sure either on the mechanism of action um, of how nitrous uh, interferes with the B12. Um, pathway. Um, but I'm curious to learn more from Ravi. This is such a brilliant case. And, you know, the thing is, um, I just did a little bit of cognitive autopsy before is that, you know, that MBA, um, I would also say like, it's good uh, practice to take, you know, serious complaints seriously. And, you know, you don't want to anchor. However, like, you know, making sure, you know, the trauma surveys and everything is done is good practice. Because again, like your known misdiagnosis are still your known misdiagnosis. And by not anchoring, I think is uh, the key thing here in this case. Um, Ravi, I'm so excited to learn more from you. So brilliant there. Uh, I actually wasn't aware of this association, but uh, I really want to uh, give you kudos for, for knowing that, uh, especially if somebody comes in and discloses that they use whippets and I'm not even familiar with that. I know about glue sniffing, paint sniffing and other things of other toxic inhalants, but uh, I wasn't really aware about uh, whippets causing this, but you're absolutely right. Um, labs that were done, B12 was less than 146 normal, uh, lower limit of normal is 213 and the homocysteine was greater than 50 and the upper limit of normal was 15, which uh, clings to the diagnosis. So. Um, it, it should be aware that whippets is a very easily accessible recreational drug and can cause a euphoric state. And um, it's commonly found in households and can be very easily used by teenagers. So definitely ask if you're within, if you're in the pediatric population in a clinic, ask if there are um, similar sort of uh, recreational drug use. The way it works, I don't think it's actually known, but there are severe neurological complications caused by inactivating B12 mediated pathways, or there may be direct neurotoxicity. And with long-term use, you can have serious end organ damage and even death. Um, so by, by discontinuing the nitrous oxide and B12 supplementation, you could partially improve symptoms, but there has been cases where there's irreversible neuronal damage and death. Uh, so great job, uh, Jack and Charmin. Thank you so much, Ravi. I really, I. I echo Charmin in terms of just applauding not only the brilliance of this case, but also the way that that you laid it out for us, because I think that um, uh, it's it's such a real world challenge to have to grapple with the recent MBA as well as as well as these these, these findings. And I know something that Charmin and I have reflected on a couple of times before that it's not just about getting to the final diagnosis, but it's also about the ways in which we get there. And I just want to want to elevate and highlight Charmin's point that in somebody who has these symptoms, getting to the diagnosis of whippet-induced myeloradiculopathy um, uh, uh, in, invariably should come through getting an MRI to rule out another cause of, of, of cord compression. And so even if, 
even if we had this this history right from the get-go, that this is somebody who uses whippets, still going through the process of ruling out the more common causes, because um, uh, while it's not necessarily a diagnosis of, of exclusion, there can be far more sinister things to rule out on the way to making the diagnosis of nitrous oxide-induced myelopathy like this. So thank you so much for bringing this to us. Yeah, Ravi, it's such a brilliant case. And I just want to um, highlight, uh, Yasmin, thank you so much for putting this in the chat that um, nitric oxide in inactivates B12. So its cofactor role for uh, the synthesis, uh, yeah, is blocked. So yeah, so it um, basically inactivates B12, which is good to know. Thanks for pointing that out. And I kind of, I want to correct what I said earlier is that with, um, uh, I think I, uh, I said like it also can cause hematologic abnormalities. It can, but I think that as you, Jack, as you mentioned, that it causes way more neurological than hematological abnormalities in that acute phase. So I just wanted to make sure I don't mislead anybody. <laughs> um, thank you all. This was such an awesome case, Ravi. If you want to just like go over some of the teaching points and then we can call it a day. Uh, sure, sure. I try to capture uh, all the teaching points. So. Uh, we started off first with this uh, young lady with uh, coming in with uh, MVA and difficulty walking. And uh, we went through um, directly considering the MVA causing this pathology. So was the patient, we wanted more details. Uh, was the patient wearing a seatbelt? Was there high-speed trauma? Any abdominal injuries? And this difficulty walking, was it related to a specific spinal cord injury? Uh, was there associated bowel incontinence to... to determine if the signal is from the spinal cord. Uh, so we started off discussing this spinal cord, probably the, the, the center of focus here. Could there be cord compression, vertebral cord compression, spinal abscess, hematoma, muscular injuries, uh, even doing a trauma survey to determine if that was the, the um, cause of this presentation. Uh, but then we jumped into neurological problem as a possible cause, so localizing it especially to the spinal cord and likely here, that was what was necessary. So we're dealing with both motor and sensory disorders. And again, uh, honing in on the spinal cord may have a combination of myelopathy plus sensory changes, plus or minus autonomic changes, which takes us back to the spinal cord as the organ um, of uh, that's uh, being entertained as causing these problems. The features that Jack highlighted, highlighted that didn't fit with myelopathy, there's signs of uh, usually with upper motor neuron disease, hyperreflexia, um, which can be compatible with myelopathy. But during the early phase of spinal process, myelitis, injury, or infarct, there can be areflexia or hyperreflexia. So that's something you need to keep in mind. And it can take several days to set in um, with both a combination of upper and lower extremity weakness. Again, this makes the spinal cord uh, the center of gravity here and more likely um, something that we need to explore. Uh, approaching spinal cord, we would um, we were then informed a compressive versus a non-compressive schema will be very helpful. And within the compressive, you can have a number of pathologies like musculoskeletal hematomas or non-muscular-like infectious spondylitis or epidural abscess that could be um, bearing on the spinal cord. Uh, and then highlighting the substance use disorder, bringing that in, um, can substances lead to this too? But we don't want to anchor on this. Uh, this could lead us down uh, a very gray, a very uh, dark path. Then, uh, so then, returning back to the spinal cord, uh, exploring the non-compressive uh, features, I guess that can can present like this. You have transverse myelitis or immune autoimmune processes, or even infarct of spinal cord. But we didn't have any signature of autoimmune phenomena with this patient or inflammation. And then uh, Charmin did uh, actually um, looked at the CBC and uh, that was uh, very good picking up on this MCV being elevated. There are many causes of MCV elevation, but in this case, the direct connection with these, all of these neurological complaints does uh, yield dividends. So is this MCV due to a megaloblastic or non-megaloblastic anemia? Uh, with hematomas, you don't need to lose a lot of blood, but the patient has anemia, but this still could be a hematoma at play, especially with this trauma. But with non-megalobastic anemias, there can be a, a, a variety of causes like alcoholism, thyroid disease. With the megalobastic anemia, you have to think about B B12, which can have neurological manifestations, or even copper could also present like this. Drugs like methotrexate could also cause macrocytosis. 
but there's no um, past uh, me medicine use of met methotrexate in this patient. So what are things that can cause dorsal uh, cord processes as we receive the MRI with hyper intense signals in the posterior columns? Uh, this could be a signature of nutritional deficiency. And then with whippets uh, being um, introduced into the conversation, the direct connection can be made that this can cause a rapidly progressive B12 deficiency. And as um, someone had highlighted in the chat that it can make B12 inaccessible and B12 can cause this myeloneuropathy, uh, dorsum column pathology via demyelination. And that's the end of the cheating points. Ravi, we're just so incredibly lucky to be able to learn from you and to, it's just absolutely amazing. Thank you so, so much for doing all that you do. We're really grateful. Uh, Jack, always a pleasure. Uh, thanks for subscribing and thank you all for joining us. We'll hopefully see you tomorrow. Bye.